In August 2008, the same year the global financial crisis broke out, 29-year-old John Stein founded Betterment with his roommate and friends. Their mission? To help the middle class and retail investors by providing them with a smart and more convenient investment solution. That's how the first reported robo-advisor was born. Today, we've invited Andreas Brown to join us to explain to us in a simple way what robo-advisors do and how they work. Andreas is a senior expert on biometrics and AI here at PwC Luxembourg, and he leads a team of data scientists and AI specialists in technology advisory. So let's get started. Welcome to a new episode of Tech Talk. You know, I remember when I was a kid, I used to love the Transformers, and I still love them. And the topic of today is robot advisors. Now, of course, they don't look like Optimus Prime, neither like Megatron, but they are becoming more and more important in today's world, especially in financial services. So what we, we have called this, this uh, episode, the one on robot advisors, explained in a simple way. And well, today we have a very special guest. Um, Carla, my co-host, will introduce Andreas Brown. So yes, today we have Andreas Brown with us, who is a senior manager at PwC Luxembourg uh, and a senior expert on biometrics and AI. Um, And he's also managing uh, our PwC Luxembourg AI lab, but we will tell him more about that later. And he's also leading a team of data scientists and AI specialists in technology advisory. So quite a lot. Yeah, thank so you very much. It seems like I'm a busy person. <laughs> yes. <laughs> exactly. Welcome, Andreas. Thank well, you. Already, already booked 45 minutes to, to record this one has been a challenge. <laughs> <laughs> it's the best proof. Welcome, Andrea. Thank you, Andreas. Thank, thank for being with very us. Very welcome. Very welcome. Happy to spend a few minutes with you. Awesome. Well, so, uh, uh, Carla, Carla has prepared a set of questions. Um, uh, so many questions. So many questions. That's why I wanted to alert you that she, she has gone a bit crazy. With, <laughs> we don't it, have to go through all of them, though. No, because the matter is pretty exciting. And, um, it is. Maybe, maybe Carla, just kick off, kick off the episode with the first question. Yeah, we like to start with the basics, actually, um, because, well, it's a perfect way to set the scene. Uh, first question is, what is a robo-advisor? So most uh, easily said, it's a form of automated financial advisor that uh, yeah, works without human intervention or with at least a very reduced level of human intervention. And they have been around uh, already for more than 10 years. So they became quite popular uh, around the financial crisis when it was noticed that the financial services as a whole have to change. So they provide various types of financial advice. It can go from analyzing your savings or your account, what kind of amount you are spending. But we are really most commonly used the term when we are talking about investment advice on on stocks, on your portfolio, on what kind of stocks to buy. So that is... uh, what is a robo-advisor in short. And of course, uh, for me, it's the interesting part that AI is becoming more and more common in robo-advisory. And we will talk about this, I think, a little bit more. And then, Andreas, you mentioned the investment portfolio, but it's it's more for the retail investor, like like you and I or Carla, or it's, it's at institutional level? It is really for both. So um, I think it was initially um, used only on the professional level. So when you had um, financial advisors that had to increase, had to cope with an increasing amount of data with many more products that coming onto the market and they need software tools, some automation in the background to be able to manage that, to uh, get all of the information they need to then propose to their clients the best investment strategy. But really, the trend that that started some 10 years ago is more on retail investment. So for investors like uh, like you and I that don't have a lot of money, that don't go into private <laughs> banking, that are looking for some further opportunities on uh, on investment, but uh, want to do that, yeah, in a in a smart and meaningful way that is also cheaper. So in a way, it's democratizing uh, investment solutions for people. 
In definitely, that is one one of the main advantages that robot advisory has brought. So uh, many robot advisory companies allow you to do this by with putting in very little money, or with uh, so you can start from zero, or it starts with a few thousand euros. Um, if you co come to an institutional investor, they might not uh, start talking to you before you are planning to invest a hundred thousand exactly. <laughs> or more. And so that is one of the the key features of this robot advisory is that it opened up the whole investment market for a much uh, broader public. Okay. So okay. can you tell us a bit what distinguishes a robo-advisor from a traditional financial advisor? So one of the key aspects is really about um, speed and data. So a robo-advisor can act at the processing speed of a modern computer. It can take decisions very quickly and it can take into account a lot of data that is flowing in from various sources in the internet, from public sources when it comes about traded stocks, but also from private sources that the um, company that hosts this robo-advisor might have. And that it can do that as, at a very high speed that is just not uh, yeah, comparable by what human financial advisors uh, can do because they still have to manually trigger uh, many of the investments unless we go to very specialized uh, trading platforms as well. Another point is uh, definitely the, the cost. So um, when you are trying to go into actively managed investment portfolios, you are looking at fees that are somewhere between 1% and 2% of what you put in per year. Robo-advisors are able to do that uh, much more cheaply. So you have some companies that at least for a certain amount of money even start at a 0% rate, but typically we look at 0.25% to 0.5%. So it's quite a significant difference that is particularly interesting for those that want to do, let's say, a more traditional investment uh, strategy by just putting a certain amount of money in every month and trying to have gains over the long term. So for them, this uh, reduced uh, fee per year can create, can make quite a big difference in the end. Yeah, Andres, by, by default, uh, you know, artificial intelligence by default has some biases. Um, so my question is, you know, a sort of team between the, the robot advisor and the traditional financial advisor could work it's is this a way to avoid any bias that can can you know can appear in the process so definitely uh, working in tandem with a human uh, can help in reducing significantly the biases so in generally ai systems uh, will always have some sort of bias because they are trained with data that has been collected by humans and has been labeled by humans and so we replicate the biases that we see. But if we work in tandem, um, the robot advisor is able to capture a lot of information out of the wannabe investor, um, like creating their risk profile, um, figuring out in what kind of investments they want to go. Do they rather want to go only in green investments in something that uh, is, is good for good for earth or do they want to go into more risky investments such as Bitcoin and so on. So all these questions about identifying what the human wants helps in kind of putting their own machine bias on that and therefore will help to get a better results if both uh, are working together as a tandem. Mm -hmm. And... Um, so, so if, for instance, someone comes comes to me and says, Luis, what would you suggest? Um, shall I bet on robot advisors? Shall I bet on the norm, normal traditional human advice of my banker? Of course, if, if the person has my, um, wealth, is wealthy enough, <laughs> as you <laughs> mentioned before, to, to invest, you know. Um, so so, so which, which advice would you, would you give? But I am sure, Luis, that most of your friends are uh, in those circles <laughs> where they are considering between private banking or robot advisory. <laughs> but so what, what I would say is that in terms of investment, if you are technology aware, if you are mobile first, if you are very much into technology, then uh, there is really that is one of the key aspects that should make you choose um, a robot advisor. Also, if you are a beginner in investment, if you want to invest money but have not uh, too much knowledge in that, a robo-advisor can help you uh, getting a kickstart because it has learned from many hundreds and thousands of people that have done this kind of investments before and can assess quite well uh, in what group you belong and where your money is best spent. 
However, it's uh, of course there are challenges uh, in a sense when you prefer the human contact or when you want to go into very more niche investments, something that is a bit unusual, that is not quite standard, then it's often more challenging for robo-advisors as still to this day to replicate that. And there it's uh, more useful to um, discuss all of this together with a human. Yeah, I remember now a friend of mine, a couple of them are investing, you know, I think they use a platform, but I think I can mention the name is eToro. Uh, and they were very happy because Amazon and Apple were going up, especially during Corona, well, when mm -hmm. Corona started. Is eToro a sort of robot advisor or is that something completely different? So eToro, I think, also includes some robot advisory, but I think the main selling uh, item of this platform is the social uh, aspect. So you can essentially, uh, it's, it's like a social network for investors. So you can follow the portfolio of, uh, of uh, friends or of well-known investors. And you can even follow that portfolio with your money. So you invest a certain amount of money and it will be invested the same way as this uh, person that has been very successful in the past. So this is the main item of this platform. They do, okay. however, also have offerings that are more related to um, robo-advisory when it comes about automatically investing. So, Carla, what, which which is the next question? You are so silent today. I, think. I know. Is everything right? <laughs> <laughs> Everything's okay. I'm just uh, thinking because uh, I've been doing some reading uh, about uh, the topic, actually. And uh, one of the features that I came across with for robo-advisors, and now, Andreas, you're going to correct me if I'm wrong, is that uh, robo-advisors, they they believe or they believe i mean they start with the premise that they cannot beat the market and hence they bet more on di diversification so they don't invest uh just in one basket is that uh, correct i think that would have been correct if we look a few years in the past so right the first robo advisory were mostly associated to etfs so in uh, investing in exactly. um, in instruments that are really closely following the market but right now, you also have a very broad view of different robo-advisors that are looking at your risk profile. So what, how risky do you want to be? Do you want to have, for example, Bitcoin or investments like that? Mm -hmm. Do you want to um, invest maybe in options that are um, yeah, more dangerous, but also might uh, reap higher benefits? So depending on your risk profile, there is now a broad variety of robo-advisors or even robo-advisors that adapt to your specific risk profile and go from very, say, boring investments where they will only uh, go into bonds uh, with a guaranteed return of maybe mm -hmm. a half a percent or something, or they follow the market as close as possible, or they go into something very risky with a chance of higher gains, or, but also a chance, of course, of higher losses. Okay. You know what, well, I, I thanks. Was thinking, I was thinking. Um, you remember Andreas, this robot uh, <clears throat> that appears in every major asset and wealth management event. These were big eyes. Uh, I don't remember the name now. Uh, but but I always think when 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 it comes to sort of advisors, I always think of this cool, friendly. <laughs> uh, you you think nice, more? Yeah. Yeah, with a nice more of, of robot, uh, ro Sony's robot dog, Ivo, than of uh, hell of Odyssey <laughs> in space. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know, because it's yeah. probably the romantic idea I grew up with uh, when, when thinking of robots. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know you, Carla, but you know, I am, I am, I am the Transformers generation, like I mentioned in the beginning. Yeah. <laughs> every time, every time I, 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 you know, I read or listen the word robo, my ideas of it's friendly. Um, and, you know, now with all these trends saying, or trends, right, or, or you know, um, fears in the world saying that robots are taking over, you know, I always like to think of them as friendly creatures. Um, well, that's nice. That's mm. nice of you. <laughs> <laughs> so um, um, and I'm saying this because the next question, it's about the workplace. Um, so can AI transform the, the workplace? Do you think so? Well, of course, AI can uh, transform the workplace, and in many cases, it already has done so. So um, there are various items where uh, people can just become more efficient in uh, finding information. There are people can become more efficient in uh, 
in uh, yeah, communication. I mean, one common example that many of us have uh, exhibited during the times of COVID is that right suddenly all of our video communication tools allow us to blur the background so our home offices don't look as um, desperatingly boring or we can use virtual backgrounds. I mean, this is also, let's say, a more fun or less serious application of AI. But on a more serious note, uh, yes, AI can help us primarily increasing in increasing productivity. We can find information quicker. We can uh, generate all of the materials that we have to generate much quicker. We are able to take information in at a much higher rate by the help of AI that helps us to focus really on those parts that are interesting. So the general idea is that AI helps us becoming more productive by taking away the boring stuff and letting us then taking the more interesting uh, decisions where really some human intervention is required. So we are looking into AI as more of a decision support system. Mm -hmm. And can you give us examples of other AI cases that support uh, decision making? So the is of course um, there are quite a few number of uh, other examples is in decision making. So, for example, we have uh, in um, let's see, we have one example is for example your your modern car uses already a lot of computer vision systems to recognize. Um, to recognize signs, to recognize construction sites and so on, and will give you a warning. So in that case, it helps you take the right decision in being more alert now during your drive and taking, uh, therefore, a better decision in driving slower or being warned before it comes to an accident. We also have, uh, in the case in the, in the medical field, is a very common example where we have radiologists that look at x-rays or MRT images all day, and they are supported by AI that already does a pre-analysis of this image and again helps the radiologist to focus on the really important part uh, and therefore making better quality wow. decisions. It's also... But right now, our more uh, common example where our team of data scientists is also working on that with the PCR tests that help us uh, assessing if a person has COVID or not, it can be actually pre-assessed yeah. by AI. And afterwards, the experts that just does a confirmation on that, again, helping them to move much quicker or to look at much more tests at the same amount of time. Well, that's that's incredible. Yeah, it's, it's incredible the power and potential that AI has to make our lives better, actually. And, and when it comes to, you know, you mentioned just now COVID-19. So what is what is the AI system reading in that case? It's reading the, 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 the test results, it's reading how people it's coughing, how many times. Uh, no, so it's, um, I mean, there are many cases in how AI is helping also during the COVID crisis. I mean, the, the PCR test is one example where this can be automated or made more efficient, um, just so we can do more tests at the same time and, or we can help the, yeah, the highly qualified uh, lab people in uh, reducing some of their workload. But also um, the speed in which vaccines were developed, uh, they are right now already being distributed in some countries. Um, this is really unprecedented, the speed in which that has happened. And also that is partially supported by AI that was helping in both the pharmaceutical research of the companies that moved very quickly in this domain, but also in uh, supply chain management. So how are we able to... Uh, when, when we develop a new vaccine, how are we able to produce it quickly and produce it quickly at quantities? And here is also something where um, certain companies that focus on AI in logistics and in su supply chain have uh, supported these medical companies in ramping up their production quite quickly. Well, so in a sense, there is quite uh, a lot of motion going on. And of course, mm -hmm. it helped helped us in general, the, uh, us to understand how quickly the digital transformation can, can leap forward. So right now, instead of uh, sitting in a cozy studio as, and sipping on a coffee, we are doing this nice podcast completely virtually. Um, of course, we, <laughs> I would prefer to sit next to you and have this discussion more face to face. But I mean, it, it works. So it ha helped us in keeping kind of the same level of productivity or the same level of quality of our work, even when the whole situation around us has uh, completely changed. You, you yeah, know, your answer true. gives perfect room for one of the questions we had. Um, 
and it was if the COVID-19 pandemic uh, has changed somehow the perception, the perception regarding um, AI, and and apparently so. I mean, but based on what, what you just said, um, I hope you know the general public idea of, of how AI can help positively impact positively our lives uh, will change or it's changing. I mean, it's it's definitely a good case on, on some of the positive aspects that AI can have. Of course, at the same time, we have uh, some cases where AI was used in a, say, more broader or overreaching way in some people that uh, used the pandemic as an excuse to increase surveillance of their people and also um, use AI for that purpose. So there are is of course always uh, uh, two two sides of the matter. So one has to make sure to at least in our facility, you know, in our small way to help push the right way of AI forward, the responsible way of using AI and making sure that uh, whatever we are using this very powerful technology for is to the best of uh, us. Exactly. Um, so how. How do you think that businesses can truly harness the power of AI? Do you have any tips um, to, to do it in a positive, positive way, of course? I mean, first of all, don't be afraid of AI is, is the tip number one. I mean, it can work in small steps. So it doesn't mean that when you want to use AI, you have to transform all of your business and make sure that it's super aligned to AI. No, that that is not the case. There are small tools, small buildings block that are sure to help certain departments, departments in your organization to become more efficient or do safe a certain way. So, so it's really, there is no reason to be afraid. There is so many uh, things available that can make your life easy and can sure, surely support your business. The second part is, of course, that people are important. It's there is uh, guaranteed in your organization already a lot of people that are very AI aware, that have a lot of drive, that have in are interested in topics around data and AI, and that can help you moving forward. And of course, also um, you have to keep your people on, always on board when it comes to uh, to implementing AI. You want to make sure that it's to their benefit, that you can help them in the best way possible, and uh, it's really about um, yeah, making things more efficient, helping people get the work done, because it's uh, not really the case that we uh, are trying to replace all people by AI robots of exactly. the bad kind. <laughs> Actually, I had uh, also one of the questions was about this fear of artificial intelligence replacing humans and taking their jobs, because I have the feeling that this is has become a widespread belief and people don't even mm. reconsider that it might, it, it's not true. Um, so, well, I was going to ask you what's your take on it, but you you mentioned it already. So, you you don't think that AI could replace humans at all? No. Well, I mean, it's uh, of course the question around it is a bit is more always more complicated. Uh, but the the general or the main point is that the workforce is already shrinking or is about to shrink in most developed countries. But we still try to get the same work done. Uh, so we can already see the effect that we have a lack of care personnel, we have a lack of engineers. In uh, If you look at countries such as Germany, in Japan, we'll use 20 million workers in the next 20 years. So there is just the problem that we will have uh, many fewer workers to do this, the same things that we are doing right now. So the notion that globally we will be losing uh, or we will have mass unemployment is a bit overtaken. So it's really how can we get the same stuff done with fewer people and AI can help yeah, nurses in simplifying their administrative tasks so they don't have to, the, they can focus more on their patients and don't have to spend half of their time filling out paperwork or it can help financial advisors in monitoring compliance so they, that they can help support more and more uh, clients directly and don't have to, again, spend a lot of time on documentation because AI has automated this more boring part of the work. So there are quite opportunities for us to make work more interesting and not being uh, kicked out immediately. <laughs> yeah, I read uh, that. Uh, I read a very interesting article from the World Economic Forum, uh, which was uh, the title is "Don't Fear AI; It Will Lead to Long-Term Job Job Growth." And I guess the question is, 
uh, more about reskilling and upskilling people for the, the jobs that are going to be created thanks to, to these changes. Indeed, I mean, that, that is definitely the case. Uh, so I think we the same amount level of fear and more computers were developed or implemented in the workplace. The, the same amount of fear we had when more and more robots came into manufacturing. Uh, so actual robots, not like our financial robots, but actual robots coming into manufacturing. But the case in point is that uh, we still we have more people employed than any point in history. So we are very good at keeping ourselves busy and we are very good <laughs> at learning new things. So, yes, it's a, a lot about upskilling. It's about a lot about reskilling. And it's how can we make uh, best use of all of the tools that are now at our disposition? Well, Carla, may I be the bad boy of the conversation? Of course, so, you are course. quite. You are That's... awfully quiet, Luis. So no, it's because I am reflecting. I am reflecting on what Andreas. Of course, I don't think robots will replace everything, but they will definitely trigger um, a structural transformation in the world of work, where or we will have winners and we will have losers. And what I mean by losers is those people not necessarily prepared or are willing to. Uh, upskill themselves or being upskilled so they the system naturally will set them aside or we leave them behind so i don't want to be negative i just want to be realistic that's not a every, good point i think exactly i mean not what drives me a bit crazy is that when you read this kind of or the world economic forum or whoever else that is writing about ai they are so positive all the time and i'm just realistic i mean any transformation implies Winners and losers in 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 the figurative way, you know. If you know what I, if you understand yeah. what I'm, yeah. No, it's it's definitely so. So there are certainly. Uh, I mean, what I told us the historic ex examples of people of when when uh, more computers came into the workplace, there was a large number of people that used data entry or filing or things like that that were then out of a job, and if they didn't reskill, they remained out of a job. And Things like that will will definitely keep happening. But uh, what what you have to look for in these kind of articles that the World Economic Forum is, they usually look at a very macro level. So, exactly. so meaning that on average, more jobs will be created thanks to AI than jobs will be lost. But of course, that does not mean that there will be no people exactly. losing their jobs due of to course. AI. So that will definitely be the case. Yeah, And um, it's something where... Of course, we want our policymakers and our governments to have a, have a good eye on to make sure that uh, these kind of things are mitigated and offering people the best potential opportunity to reskill and upskill. And I think, uh, yeah, the world has become better, I think, in uh, preparing people for this kind of event. So the level of support that you have these days in doing this kind of additional training, ranging from online courses to further education with, with uh, teachers in government provided systems and so on. There, there is such a large number of things available to you that uh, will help you get prepared for the future. So WEF, please don't hate me. I just wanted to make the point and, and balance things out because people need No, that it's, to, yeah. it's all about balance. I mean, we, exactly. we are not here to just deliver happy news. We are here to deliver information. <laughs> but I have a very ha happy, happy news. And maybe I leave, I, I, I leave you the room, um, um, uh, Carla, so you can announce something that is going on at PwC Luxembourg regarding AI. Exactly. Well, I actually already mentioned it in the beginning of our podcast today, but PwC Luxembourg opened Europe's first PwC A Lab in 2020, which is really, really great news. Um, and this was following PwC USA and Japan. So, Andreas, what is it and what's the goal of this uh, AI Lab? So, the, our AI lab is really um, a space to experience artificial intelligence as well as to build AI tools for our clients. So, it's uh, located in our nice premises at PwC where you can come and you have our AI experts that uh, show you different business cases or different demonstrators of what has happened, uh, but always with the goal to um, create something together. So, we always have the three key goals of, yeah, 
first of all, demystifying AI. We want to help everybody to understand what AI really is, what, what it can bring. And we don't only want to do that via podcasts, but also by inviting people into our lab and uh, teaching them about AI. We also want to, of course, innovate on AI. Here is all about co-creation and creating proof of concept together with our client, with the help of our business experts, to really tackle specific challenges that our uh, clients might be having and see if AI is a potential solution for that. Again, here a little bit negative, AI is not always the solution, but often. The third point uh, is the, about yeah, productizing AI, I would say. It's here we, we have, of course, a number of AI experts. We also have data engineers. We have specialists that can really help make a product out of uh, this AI proof of concept and helping getting it implemented in your organization. So we want to start from the very beginning on uh, teaching about AI, going to the very end of making sure that AI is the as success, successful as it can be in your organization. So it's always, I mean, when I think of, of it, and I think of, of, of processes and, and, and maybe the value chain. So the idea here is to think of AI as, a, as, as uh, I mean, AI can help certain parts of that chain or maybe the entire chain, but not necessarily everything. So the idea is to identify exactly. where no, is, is that the idea, I think? It's, it's, it's definitely one of the ideas. So, so AI, uh, a bi every business has challenges. AI is uh, the best tool to solve some, but not for all of them. When you look at the whole chain of how business operate, there are some things that are very well managed by AI. There are other items that really are uh, better benefited or have to remain uh, in, let's say, more human hands when it comes to these aspects. So it's really about uh, co-creating, digging really deep into the specific challenge and figuring out um, what is the potential solution for you. And in that case, we also benefit from the mentioned collaboration with the United States and Japan, who have done this kind of exercise already many times in the past. And this is something that our European clients then can benefit from, where we can tell them how, how this was solved uh, somewhere in the US or in Japan. Nice. That's really interesting. I, I, I think I will say something, uh, I don't know, childish, but if Megatron was, was a robot advisor, oh my he God. would likely tell me, Luis, go and invest uh, in, 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 in cryptocurrencies, but on the dark web. So you <laughs> What? <laughs> no, it's um, just, I'm just saying something that it senses, but I was just thinking, you know, because the guy was a bad guy, so he wants to go, you know, through the illegal means. He wants, he wants you to invest in his specific pyramid scheme, so his money, your money, <laughs> ends up in his probably, robot hands. Probably weapons, because he was crazy about that. I'm just recording mm. my childhood. So um, I, I, I have no more questions. I think it was very exciting, nice, interesting. Carla, do you have anything still in the pipe? Yes, I want to ask Andreas if we can visit the AI lab. <laughs> yes, the AI lab is open. So we are general, we are open for business. Uh, we are more than happy to welcome some of the clients. We have a very large facility or large room. So even uh, during the times of COVID, we can do some small scale events where we can invite a few to us. But of course, we are uh, also going with the times and will provide more and more uh, virtual events around this. Uh, one of them we already had last week and more is uh, to come. So we are more than happy to welcome yeah, clients into our AI lab, be it virtual or be it physical. And hopefully for all of us, it will become more and more physical again physical. in the near future. <laughs> we really hope yeah. so. <laughs> really yes. hope so. Well, have a very, very nice day and a very nice day to everybody. Carla, any, any last word, sentence, a citation, quote you want to say? No, that's all for today. Thank you so much, Andreas, for joining us. It was very interesting. Thanks, Luis. Thanks um, Carla, for having me. Have a very nice, very nice day. Have week. a nice day. Ciao, ciao. The same to you. Goodbye. Bye-bye. And that's all for today. We hope that you enjoyed this episode as much as we did. Thank you for listening to us and stay tuned for the next episode.